starts in uh, exile. And it's not just recent exile. The Jews have been out of the Promised Land for a hundred years. Some of them went back, we know those stories of Ezra and Nehemiah, but some people today, some characters, the Jews we find have Persian names. Mordecai probably is uh, referencing the Babylonian god Marduk. Esther, some people say it means a star, other people say uh, it's Ishtar, another foreign god. Uh, she, she, we're told her Jewish name is Hadassah, but their whole book, these Jewish characters are referred to by foreign names. Their identity is in danger of being wiped out. Um, we find that it's kind of like when Israel was entering Canaan, when Israel's in exile, the question is, do they become like the people around them and lose their unique, uh, the unique thing that God has given them to offer? Israel, or, or do they be, be killed? Sometimes that was the choice that they felt they had to make. Either, either the Canaanites are going to kill us or we become like them. Either we, we fit in where we are in exile or we get wiped out. And that's the tension that we find in the book of Esther. Assimilation on the one hand, annihilation on the other hand. What will happen is there any hope? And so the book begins with um, the king uh, deciding to get rid of his queen for refusing to come when he requested after some days of banquet and drinking. He decides to look for a new queen. Esther finds favor and becomes a new queen. But three times we are told she conceals her identity on Mordecai's advice. In chapter 2, verse 7, verse 10, and verse 20. Why is she concealing her identity? It looks like she's fitting in. We don't hear of her being like Daniel, refusing to eat the food of the locals because it's been offered to foreign gods. Uh, we don't hear her raising any protest when she's taken into a harem of hundreds of ladies that sleep with this king night after night until he chooses which one he wants to marry. Then even after he marries her, he goes and calls more of the virgins again to do the same. We already know that uh, you were not supposed to marry someone who's going to make you worship foreign gods. Esther doesn't seem to have much of a choice. She's just, you know, taken from the, okay, we're rounding up all the young women, just taken. But she, what is she doing? Is she just fitting in? She's not telling anyone. She's not standing for her convictions. So even though it seems like, wow, well, yay, Esther becomes queen, there's a real danger here. There's a danger of the Jews in, she's representing the Jews in exile, losing their identity and falling away from, uh, from God. She's a very morally ambiguous character in some ways. We're not sure if we should be like her or not. How should we react in such situations? Then we get a new, uh, a new threat. Haman is promoted. And we, we and if you know the story, Haman is the ultimate bad guy. Uh, not only that, it says Haman the Agagite. And Agag was probably referring to um, this king of the Amalekites. At, at when the Jews celebrate this festival that Esther talks about Purim, they actually read um, scriptures that talk about the Amalekites. From, uh, Deuteronomy 25, 17 to 19, Joshua and the, uh, meets the Amalekites. These are the first people to attack Israel in the Promised Land. They're like the quintessential enemies, the stereotype enemies of Israel when they're trying to come into the promise God has given them. Um, there's also another reference in Exodus 17, um, 8 to 16. And it's interesting that um, Mordecai is introduced as a son of Kish, um, which refers to Saul's lineage, the Benjamite, uh, who also went to war with the Amalekites and failed to completely destroy them. And that was when God uh, said that Saul had lost his kingship and anointing. So it's very interesting 
Mordecai, I hope that you know the story a little bit because I'm not giving you so much detail, um, refuses to bow down to Haman, who has been promoted in the, in the ranks of the court officials. He refuses to assimilate, but now he's facing a different threat, annihilation. This man, Haman, decides it's not enough to kill Mordecai, he wants to kill the whole Jewish people. So now it's a strange reversal. Uh, it's like the inter Israelites are entering into this foreign land with these foreign gods. Esther is deciding sort of to go along with it. Mordecai is saying no, and here we meet the Amalekites, ready to wipe them out. Mordecai has now put his entire people in danger. Was that the right choice? The bad guy is winning, and God's people are in danger. Haman actually gets the king's permission, signs a law that the, all the Jews will be attacked and plundered on a certain day. It's a cruel reversal that Saul was supposed to destroy the Amalekites. Now, it looks like the descendants are going to do the opposite, and Israel will face a genocide and will be wiped off the face of the earth instead of what God had originally wanted um, to happen. And the good guys, the Jews, God's people, cannot do anything. Esther is helpless. We're introduced to her. She's an orphan. She's in exile. She's just taken to a harem to be a concubine, to a drunk and foreign and angry king. And she can't even go into the presence of her own husband until he calls her, and she hasn't done it for a month. I don't know what kind of marriage this is. <laughs> the influence she has, you would think it's very big because she's the queen. Actually, it's very little. Mordecai is also helpless. He's persecuted. He's forgotten. He actually saved the king's life. But four years pass, and his enemy is promoted. He's never rewarded. What was God doing? Now, he's endangered all the Jews. How helpless would he feel? And the interesting thing is, in the midst of this helplessness, the book of Esther never once mentions the name of God. I think it's the only book in the Bible that that happens. God is never mentioned. And it makes you to wonder, where are you, God? Will God abandon us to genocide? Will the remnant of his people be erased? Are we too far gone in exile? Are we too far away from home? Should we have returned like the others? Has our sin that made us go into exile disqualified us from being the chosen people? Are we cut off from God? Are we forsaken? Are we still his people? This is what's going through the mind of Esther and Mordecai. I'm sure when they are facing the threat of genocide in a foreign land. And I want you to read with me in Esther chapter 4 what the conversation is. I'm going to go to um, chapter 4, verse 11 to 16. Um, Mordecai has been mourning and fasting when he hears this decree from Haman. And he's, he's making such a scene that Esther hears about it and he's not allowed to enter into the court because he's not, he's in a mourning state. Um, but Esther has this go-between, uh, have a conversation with Mordecai. Why are you mourning? And Mordecai tells her, we've well, just been, there's a, a law come from your husband uh, that we're all going to be killed. And she wasn't even aware. Um, but uh, he says, you know, can you just go in and beg for mercy to the, to the king? And she says, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But 30 days have passed since I was called to go to the king. So she's like, okay, so either I die or I die. I mean, <laughs> How is this going to help you at all? Um, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. 
Or will you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. I wonder if Esther is still thinking that assimilation is an option. She's almost like, hmm, well, the Jews might die, but I'm in a royal house. Maybe I can, maybe I can survive this. And Mordecai says, don't think that you are going to be saved when your people are annihilated. God, God will see that. But Mordecai, uh, but, but Esther also knows that annihilation could come to her by going to the king. She could be killed. Is that her only choice, assimilation or annihilation again? Mordecai says something very important. Deliverance will come. We're asking, where is God? We're asking, how could he allow us to be in this position? And Mordecai says, deliverance will come. Are you going to participate in it or not? Even though God is not visible in the circumstances, even though they are far from home and they have sinned, Mordecai has faith. And Esther responds. She chooses to serve her people or die trying. She says, if I perish, I perish. She doesn't know what will happen. She could perish. In fact, that's probably the two options she has. Die one way, die the other way. But she acts in faith. She hopes that God is the real king even in exile. And even before she goes to the king of Persia to ask for her life, she goes before God. She fasts and prays with her people, hoping that he will lift his scepter and let them live in the heavenly realms. They have this great conversation, they decide their plan, and the suspense continues in the story. Esther is still alive, she goes to the king, but all she does is invite him to a, a banquet which probably was very strategic because it seems this guy liked to party a lot. Um, but she hasn't said she's a Jew yet, and the Jews are still going to be killed. There's an, the reader is like, what's happening? Well, do something. The time is running out. And then Haman, on his way home from the banquet, plans to execute Mordecai. Things haven't gotten better, they've gotten worse. But then we get to the turning point. It just so happens that night the king cannot sleep. It just so happens that he decides to have some bedtime reading of the record of five years ago, which sounds like a good boring read to me. <laughs> but instead of boring him to sleep, it actually reminds him of someone who saved his life five years ago and was never honored. It just so happens that at that moment, Haman is on his way to the king to tell him about his great idea to execute Mordecai. The king asks him, how would I honor somebody? And he doesn't tell him the identity of this person. Just the way even Mordecai never told him the identity of these people he's going to, uh, you know, put an edict against. And Haman thinks, of course it's me he wants to honor. And so Haman says a very nice way to honor him. And the king says, go do that for Mordecai. Haman is like, ah, here I am, I'm about to ask you for permission to kill him, and you're telling me to what? Instead of killing and shaming Mordecai, now Haman has to go publicly honor him. From this moment, everything in the story starts to go in reverse. This is a turning point. In fact, the author has structured this story with what we call a chiasm. So it's a symmetrical story. Um, everything that happens in the beginning gets repeated in some way or changed in a new way at the end. And then everything just before this event happens just after this event. It's a series of reversals. So right after this turning point, Haman's friend Zeresh, who told him to go hang Mordecai, now tells him that since Mordecai is Jewish, nothing can stand against him and Haman is doomed. Then Esther holds another banquet, and this time she reveals her identity. On the way home from the last banquet, Haman had planned to execute Mordecai. But at the end of this banquet, instead, he's the one who's executed. 
Now, Esther and Mordecai plan again, but this time they have the king's approval. At the beginning of the story, Haman made a decree to kill the Jews. Now, Mordecai decrees that the Jews can defend themselves. Haman had been elevated to power before, but now Mordecai is elevated to power. Esther and Mordecai saved the king in the beginning, but now the king helps them save the Jewish people. Though the book began with the king holding two feasts to display his splendor, in the end, the Jewish people are the ones who celebrate with two feasts of Purim in the day after, and Mordecai's splendor is highlighted. The amazing thing about this structure you see in the book of Esther is that every detail seems to have been important. Every action was reversed. The author portrays God's plan as if it was perfectly designed. At the very center, the very turning point, were a series of it just so happens. The French writer Théophile Bohotier said, Chance is perhaps the pseudonym of God when he does not want to send. Although the author never mentions God's name, the way that the, the author structures this story shows that God's providence was at work the whole time. We learn that God is at work even when it looks like it's just natural circumstances, even when we don't see his hand in a miracle, even when he doesn't speak to us with an audible voice. That's why today when celebrating Purim, that this festival is still celebrated today by Jews, they actually dress up in costumes because they want to remember that God's work and his miracle was disguised as natural circumstances. And this is a lesson we see elsewhere in scripture. Another example is Joseph, where uh, this is a story that the author actually alludes to or hints at. For example, the author includes details such as Esther finding favor with the eunuch in charge of the harem, the two chamberlains in the beginning of a plot, similar to the, the two chamberlains who Joseph eats in prison. The king's disturbed sleep being a turning point in the story. And I think that the author might be hinting at a larger similarity with the Joseph narrative. Joseph, too, had good reason to think he was abandoned by God in a foreign land. Like Mordecai and Esther saved the king, Joseph did good things for Potiphar and the cupbearer, but he wasn't rewarded either. Instead, he was thrown in prison and then forgotten again. But all these events were God's hands setting up the salvation plan, enabling Joseph to reconcile with his family, save Egypt, and save the nation of Israel from becoming as extinct during a famine. God fulfilled what he had promised to Joseph in his dreams, and he never gave up on his chosen people. Time and time again, in scripture, we see when people ask, where are you, God? There's something around the corner. The disciples, when they thought the man who was the Messiah had died, and he cried out, God, why have you forsaken me? They didn't know this was the reversal of everything, the moment of victory. My parents uh, came to Tanzania as missionaries when I was two and my little brother was eight months. Uh, the first term, the first year, they were sick 40 times and then they stopped counting. Yes. Uh, I mean, us as a family. And my dad had hepatitis A. Uh, my parents had a lot of culture shock, they had panic attacks, it was a very, very hard three years. And the hardest thing was my mom was pregnant with her third child, and um, she got malaria, and lost the baby at uh, about four or five months. And she said, if I wouldn't have been here, if I wouldn't have gotten malaria, my child might have been alive. And my parents named that child Esther Hope. And they went back after the three years for, for the visit to the US and raising funds. And my dad said, do you want to go back? And my mom says, I think God wants us to, but let's not talk about it right now. <laughs> it was very, very painful for them. My dad said to God, is this how you reward your servants? And um, through the time when we were in the U.S., um, my mom actually got pregnant with twins, and she gave birth to a boy and a girl, and she really wanted to have uh, two girls and two boys by the time she was 36. She had them three months before then, and both my parents laughed and just said, wow, um, 
God has, has remembered us. But that doesn't negate the pain of that process just because you have something good happen to you. However, what I think is interesting about the story is my sister's death actually had a bigger purpose, even the suffering itself. Because my dad went back to Tanzania so, so, now being able to empathize with all the Tanzanian pastors, normally when they introduce this, uh, I have eight children, but I, uh, I had eight children, but now I have five. Most of them had actually lost somebody uh, of their own children, normally to malaria or something else like that, and enabled them to relate much better with the people there, and it made my dad to ask questions about how do Tanzanians understand sickness and death. And that's actually what he ended up studying on his PhD, which ended up getting him to learn about witchcraft accusations, and also the ones where people are accused of being witches uh, falsely, and they are, maybe, many people have been accused, but the ones who actually get persecuted and kicked out from their homes and um, killed are the weakest members of the society. The other ones are more able to defend themselves. Um, so he noticed that there was a justice issue going on, widows and orphans. Um, and foreigners in the community being persecuted more with some of these false accusations. Um, and he was able to start doing seminars with the deans of our Bible schools and to go on promoting, let's look at what the Bible says. What is our calling as Christians? How should we respond? And until it reached a point that he's been doing conferences here in, in Kenya, even to the UN, they had a summit on witchcraft accusations and one of the people who was speaking there was my dad. When I think about this, I don't say that my sister's death was a good thing, but what a legacy she has had in the world. How God has turned that suffering into something for his glory. And of course it's easy for us when we look back. It's easier for us to structure the story to show God's providence from the perspective of the happy ending. The question is whether our eyes are open to see the possibility of God at work in the middle. Other people in scripture never saw the reversal. They never knew the full story. Job never knew there was a war going on in heaven. Um, we see the patriarchs and Hebrews straining their eyes to see the promised land and they never got there themselves. That's why, even though we always focus on this part of the story of Esther, I think it is really important. Mordecai and Esther, when they make that choice, they have such an honest conversation that we can relate to. And I love what Mordecai says, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. And who knows, but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. And Esther says, if I perish, I perish. They don't know what's going to happen. It's so uncertain, who knows? I perish, I perish. We'll just see what happens. They don't know the happy ending is there. And it might not be. It might not always be something they see in their lifetime. But they hope. And they, like like uh, what someone called this, the theology of possibility. So I want to encourage you, if, if you've ever been in a situation where all hope seems lost, have you ever wondered if God has given up on you? Or if you're too far away from him and he can't hear you anymore? And you were asking, can things get any worse? Where are you? Maybe you feel like your ministry is under attack. Could be misfortunes keep happening to your leaders, division keeps on popping up, and you're already the only ones who ministry to this particular group of people and no one else is reaching. You're saying, God, we are your witnesses here. Will you let us be destroyed? Or it could be your marriage has problems. Maybe someone in your family is not Christian and they make life difficult for you. Could be an abusive spouse. Could be waiting for children and the in-laws are pressuring you through some ungodly way to fix that problem. You're asking, God, are you punishing me? God, have you abandoned me? Could be your country. If your people are being persecuted by ungodly leaders, maybe there's conflict going on. People are, are sowing violence and they're corrupt, they're bowing down to other gods or other forces. But everyday people are suffering. You're asking God, are you at work even now? Or maybe it's among your peers. The ones who see succeeding, you know they're not using God, they need to do that. While you, you're lonely, you don't have friends, you, you can't even pay your school fees. And you're just saying, why God? Do you care 
care about your people or not. Esther does not promise us that things will always go the way we hope. It doesn't promise us that we'll never suffer. It doesn't promise us that every single thing we experience will be reversed the same way it was in this story. But it does inspire us to trust God's providence, to trust that He is in control, that even when it feels like we're in exile, that God is on the throne, that even when He doesn't sign His name, He is working, and that no matter how bad things get, God is committed to redeeming His world. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And He's faithful. Can we trust this? Can we hold on to this hope in this very dark and terrifying time when we find ourselves in that moment? And I want to just end with a, a song that reminds us that God is in control, that even if it doesn't happen now, in the very end, the final say will be the one that Jehovah has, and that He is able to reverse circumstances. He is able to turn our lives around, even when there seems like there's no way. So I just want to maybe sing very, very briefly. That's only sang in the beginning.